hopefully everyone can hear me in the back room as well. <laughs> okay, welcome to Bus Boys and Poets. We're gonna start with our first program for the evening in just a few moments, okay? So give us about five minutes and we'll start with Gina Dent um, and Migos, and then after that conversation, we'll bring out Angela Davis, okay? So give us a couple moments. Hello, hello? Okay. Hello? Go ahead. first time here um, we are a company that has a tribal statement that tribal statement is our guiding principle it dictates how we as a company move in in this society in this space and I thought I would open tonight with that tribal statement just so we can understand and ground this week that bus boys is hosting for programming directed at building cultural connections and understanding what's happening in Palestine right now so Busboys and Poets is a community where racial and cultural connections are consciously uplifted, a place to take a deliberate pause to feed your mind, body, And all the people out there, it's really wonderful to see so much excitement around uh, Palestine Week. Give yourselves a big hand for breaking all sensors around, keeping the conversation low, and coming out at this time. Thank you all for being here. You know, it's, it's really funny when I put up this idea of Palestine Week, there were a lot of people says, you know, this may not be the best time to do this. And I'm always one to say, this is actually the best time to do this because it is time to uplift these voices that oftentimes have been muffled for so many years, for decades. And I think it's really important for us as a community to come together, not in a hateful way, but in a loving way, that we can become that community that we all dream about, a place where we can all respect and honor one another's opinions and ideas, a place where human uh, values are uplifted, uh, a place that my family moved to this country for, which is at America where actually the freedoms that we all enjoy are upheld. People tell me that I should go back to where I came from, and I guess Arlington would be the place that I would go to, but I, I tell them that I am actually the insurance policy for American democracy. People like myself, brown people and black people, are the people that have preserved American democracy. And you should say thank you every single morning when you wake up. We are the ones that feel the pain first. And when we feel the pain, you know you're gonna be next. So rather than waiting for that, join in this struggle so we can all fight against fascism. Uh, this is a, um, and a, a very important week for us. So it's been really quite remarkable, starting with experiencing Palestinian culture. We had a wonderful meal with uh, a very well-known chef uh, 
the, uh, the Gaza chef. She was on Anthony Bourdain for, for, uh, for an episode where he went to Gaza. And one of the things that sticks in my mind when he was in Gaza, he says, there's a lot of things that people say about this place, but this is the place where courage is born. And I think we're seeing it on display right now, don't you? It's really quite remarkable about what's going on there. And for those that say that uplifting Palestinian voices is supporting terrorism, shame on you. Really, that is shame on you. So, um, we have a wonderful program ahead and I want to make sure everybody enjoys it as much as they can. Uh, this is a, uh, a moment in history that is so important, I think, and we're all witnessing it right now. So I would love for everybody during this entire program to really pay attention to the words and the thoughts that are going to come out from this stage. I think it's really important for us to honor our speakers who have came out from far away to be here to be able to join us and support us in this very important time, I think, in not only in, in the lifetime of Palestine, but I think in this country's, uh, you know, how we approach this, how we get through this, I think will determine a lot of how we go from here on. Uh, you know, I want to say that the solidarity that's been shown by so much, so many people in the world has been remarkable and, uh, you know, unprecedented. So I think we're on the right track. So keep going. Thank you. So we're going to have a conversation first with, uh, with Dr. Gina Dent and uh, Miko Pellet. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, many, of, many of you know these folks, but I just will give you a little bit of background about them. Uh, Gina is the Dean of uh, DEI. She's the Dean of DEI and Professor of Feminist Studies, History of Consciousness and Legal Studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She has won numerous awards for her teaching, advocacy, and diversity, and research. She's the editor of Black Popular Culture. Uh, she is the author of articles on race, feminism, popular culture, and visual art. Her latest book, Abolition Feminism Now, uh, is co-written with Angela Davis, Erica Reiner, and Beth Ritchie, and it's available for you here at our independent bookstore. Uh, where's our manager? Right there. There's uh, Lori. Lori Benitez, she's right there. There's other books. Um, Miko Pellet is an outspoken anti-Zionist, Israeli-American activist, author, and outspoken advocate for Palestinian human rights and self-determination. He's also <laughs> a karate instructor. Uh, he is the author of the books The General Son, The Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, and Injustice, The Story of the Holy Land Foundation Five. I'd like to welcome them both to the stage. We're going to have a conversation for about 45 minutes. And then afterwards, we're going to take a very short break and come back with Angela Davis. So stick around. Thank you. Come on up. Thank you. So I think the microphone should work. Yep. I'm going to start with you, uh, Gina. I want to ask you, you have been leading a project or being involved in a project called Visualizing Palestine. Can you tell us a little bit about Visualizing Palestine? I know you've been involved with them. Yes, thank you, Andy. Uh, welcome, everyone. I know we're all looking forward to. So, I think it's louder. It's louder. Yeah. No one ever asked me to be louder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, thank you so much, Bus Boys and Poets, for welcoming me, as always. It's amazing to be here, coming from California. Um, yeah, some Californians in the room. All right. Um, but I was actually born in D.C. I'm actually from D.C., just FYI. Um, so, yeah, so I'm here partly because I've been running a project called Visualizing Abolition at the University of California of Santa Cruz, and it's an arts and abolition project. Uh, we work under the Institute of the Arts and Sciences, and we do programming to try to get people to understand uh, prison abolition, but from the standpoint of starting to recognize how we are inundated with images that don't allow us to think beyond the kinds of solutions that are presented to us every day by the state. And as part of that project, we're working with um, an arts uh, collaborative called Forensic Architecture. 
And also, we're doing the first show with Al Haq, which is a human rights organization located in Ramallah, Palestine. And um, that Al Haq exhibition with forensic architecture, their unit now of forensic architecture, will be the first of its kind. Uh, this is deeply important to us because what we are trying to do is to break down this divide between arts and social science research. You know, I'm, a, I'm an academic, I can get very nerdy with you all, but I can also hang, don't worry, I won't say anything too complicated. But I think it's really important for us to all understand that we are exposed to certain, not only certain uh, ideas in the images that are presented to us every day, but even when we are presented with ones with, that we think are critical of the apparatus that we're living within, we actually may still be a part of those circuits of knowledge. And so we engage with artists to really think beyond um, the ways in which we've been taught to frame issues, issues of incarceration. And often when we talk about incarceration as a black person, I'm, I'm invited to talk about uh, mass incarceration for black people. And that's very important to talk about. But it's also a narrative that's too easy, too simple, and that look, has us looking away from our settler colonial history where indigenous people are actually the most incarcerated population in the United States. We hardly ever talk about this. And also to look at other forms of carcerality that we live around, border security, immigrant detention, and also the US's support of states like Israel, an other, another settler colonial nation that we are all witnessing the violence of now. Uh, you know, you spoke uh, about visualizing abolition. At the same time, I'm thinking visualizing Palestine because oftentimes it's the images that impact us, the, how they change the narrative and how people see a certain group of people in a certain way. Uh, I want you both to talk about an image that we saw this morning. Uh, it was in the New York Times. For those of you that may have looked online, there was an image of a group of detainees, uh, prisoners, uh, people that have been taken by the IDF, Palestinian uh, men. I think there was one woman in the group, actually, they said. Uh, and they were in this big lorry. Uh, and they were all like bent over. And you can see their bodies and their faces. You can't see. They're blindfolded. Can you please speak a little bit about, about that and uh, how those types of images impact us? And it was really interesting what you said. but. Uh, please uh, uh, elaborate on that. I'd like both of you to do that. Mika, should we start with you? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here, and thank you, Andy, for hosting uh, and making, creating the space. Um, on a personal note, I, you know, I speak, especially lately, uh, a lot about Palestine and in front of big crowds, but somehow tonight, tonight is really special. And so thank you, Gina, for being here, and Angela and everybody else. I... Um, this is really a special evening, and it's a great space. So thanks for creating that. I wanted to, Andy said something about, and I'm, I'm, I'm just a couple of sentences before I answer the question. Andy said something about love and respect. And it's interesting the way the issue of Palestine is framed. I did an interview, a short interview with Pierce Morgan, nonetheless. It was a one question interview. But the st <laughs> he really cut and ran, it was really, but anyway, the interview, they sent him, they, they sent a, there we go. So an interview with Pierce Morgan. So they sent a mobile studio, and I've never done that before. It's actually in a, in a van, and you go inside the van, they close the door, and you do the interview. It's a little spooky. So we did the one question interview, it was over, and then the guy opened the door, and he said, oh, Miko, and he started speaking to me in Hebrew. He's an Israeli. And he said, so why do you hate Israel and Israelis so much? And I didn't really have time to engage with him. I said, well, I don't, like, I don't hate Israelis, but the framing of if you're pro-justice, pro-peace, pro-equality, pro-humanity, then you hate Jews, you hate Israelis. That's how this is framed, and it's so deep. You know, how, why in the world would somebody assume that if you're pro-justice, pro-equality, pro-peace, God forbid these things happen between, and I hope we're allowed to say this here, Andy, between the river and the sea, then we must hate Jews. And 
in the interview that he did before me, which I was listening to, unfortunately, they were talking about this, you know, when you say the river to the sea, then it's anti-Semitic. We're talking about equality and peace and love and respect between the river and the sea. How is that bad? But this is, this is part of the framing. So I, I just, you know, wanted to share that with you. And then this morning, we, had, we, had, we met this morning and we had a really, fa really fascinating conversation. Um, having coffee, preparing for this, and Andy brought, show, showed us this picture on the New York Times, horrifying picture of prisoners with their tops off, their heads bent down, their hands are tied behind their back in a big truck. And our initial reaction was, hmm, the New York Times is showing this, clearly these are Palestinians, clearly this is a violation of human rights. The New York Times is showing something that's kind of interesting. And, uh, and Gina, you had a completely different take on that. And just the conversation we had about that image, I think was so revealing. And then we had a conversation of whether or not we should project that image as we're discussing it. And again, Gina, you had a completely different perspective than we did, which, which I found very, very interesting. So would you please share what we talked about? Um, thank you, Mika. It's a really pleasure to be here with you. So we're not showing the image, as you can see. <laughs> it's too complicated technologically to show it, but also we had a discussion about whether to show it. So here's the thing. When you're, you know, I, how many of you read the New York Times now? Not that many in here. See, that's <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. They don't want to admit it. They that, read it, but they don't want to admit uh, it. Maybe. I mean, it, it tells you something. So, you know, being my age and my training, like I still read the New York Times almost every day. But a lot of people don't anymore, especially younger people, of course. Nonetheless, I think it's important to understand how the New York Times frames our thinking, and so. The discussion was about, you know, oh, they're finally covering some of what's happening to people when they are uh, detained and arrested uh, uh, by Israeli soldiers. But my reaction to the image was thinking about the patterns of representation. So what's the scale of the image? Where is it placed with other stories? Why is their skin showing? Why are their bodies revealed this way? So we started to talk about whose bodies are actually revealed in that way, whose bodies are always shown in a dignified way, um, clothed, smiling, or represented in some way that conforms to the notion that they are humans. So on the one hand, you know, a surface reading of that image would be, oh, the New York Times is finally acknowledging that this, these violations are happening. Another reading of that is in the context of everything else the New York Times is covering and what we're all exposed to. And by the way, I'm not blaming the Times for this. It's a much larger set of problems. Then, those, then that image um, does not have the capacity to remove us from the entire larger context in which we're coming to think about these issues. And so the other conversation we started to have after that was, what would it mean to show it to try to describe this? And then there's a question of scale. If you see something in a newspaper or on your iPad or whatever, like we were reading this morning, it's one size. If we projected that image with all of those people being detained in that way behind us, what are we communicating to all of you, right? So these are the kinds of questions that we ask at the gallery space that I work in. We're, we're trying to get people to think more and more carefully, not only about what other images we need to show and what other facts we need to bring to bear, but actually how we frame those things, how we contextualize, how we put things next to each other, what we magnify, what we diminish, how we start to think together, and how we also go from a notion that something that is rendered in black and white needs more color, needs more detail, needs more information, or that people need to be humanized. So we need to keep showing their uh, figures. We need to keep showing humans. We need to keep showing their humanity instead of recognizing that this whole dynamic of having to as assert the humanity of certain people is actually also part of the problem in the way that we engage with the problem. So these are some of the aesthetic questions that are political and that set people up to have more sophisticated political conversations. And so that's kind of how we spent a lot of our morning. I wanted to, uh, good, we have more volume on this one. Um, I wanted to, maybe, maybe over here. I want to be able to use both microphones so you guys can both talk. Um, 
the one thing I think that was also there, and if you can elaborate a little bit on that, was in that, in that page where they showed the image, above it was another headline. Can you speak about that other headline? Do you remember what the headline was? It was 24 uh, soldiers were killed. So 24 soldiers were killed. Below it is the scene of these men that are showing their skin, you can, and you don't see their faces, because all their faces are covered with uh, cloth. And the idea was, when I first looked at it, my first image that came to my head, they look like animals. Can you speak about the connection of the first headline and the second headline? You didn't know you were coming here for a lecture on, on uh, actually, uh, on, on, on media literacy, because <laughs> This, is, this has really been a media war as much as anything else. So we really need to be careful in how we interpret that. I know at the beginning uh, they, were, they were saying, and, I, and, and it was a lot of your voices that changed it, a lot of the media were saying, uh, you know, so many Israelis were killed, but so many Palestinians died. And the idea of being killed or dying, dying is just like a, a, not an active thing, right? You just die, everybody dies. So, it didn't seem like it was a terrible thing. Being killed has a different value to it. And so a lot of people made phone calls and said, no, stop this. This is bullshit. This is creating hatred. This is creating uh, danger for a lot of people. And they changed it. They started using the word kill now when it's really somebody being killed. So speak a little bit about the juxtaposition of how these headlines are put together and how they create a bigger narrative. So one, one, of the, one of the conclusions we had that came out of this was looking at that image, it could go both ways. Because if you are a Zionist and you look at that, you say, yeah, good, they're treating them, this is what they deserve. So, I mean, this is the right thing to do. Um, and then the image, of, the image of the Israeli soldiers were killed, there are all these young, smiling faces, faces of young, smiling guys who look like your best friend, your brother, your next door neighbor, people that you love, they're friendly, they're really, really nice. And I want to put this in, the, in, in a whole different context, which relates to me and my background, if, if I may. So my father was a general in the Israeli army. I served in the IDF a long, long time ago, and I wish I hadn't, but I did. And then we are also looking, or something I shared with Gina was the uh, IDF, different units, different brigades, different uh, regiments have their own social media pages and I follow them. And they're able to create this, these images of these soldiers in Gaza engaged in what we know is a horrific, horrific crime against humanity. And yet they're able to show them in these positions that make them look heroic and good looking and with their unif these, these, you know, these Rambo uniforms, I mean, they're armed to the teeth with a, and they're holding this fancy, you know, semi-automatic thing and sometimes they'll have their dog next to them because they use dogs a lot. And this whole imagery, now I was indoctrinated into Zionism at home and at school. And of course, when you're being indoctrinated when you're young, you think this is it, this is true. So I grew up actually wanting to be that image the drive for me, I mean, in my circle, refusal was not ever discussed. I wish it had been, but it wasn't. But I wanted to be one of those guys, because I thought that was heroic, and that was so cool. You know, I remember um, even a despicable human being like Benjamin Netanyahu, I remember him as a young man in uniform looking up to him, because we knew him personally, and looking up and going, wow, that's what I want to be when I grow up, to be kind of a soldier that looks like that. And it, the indoctrination is so deep, and, and, and so, and now, but now in this context of what we know is happening, they're still using these images, and obviously it still works. And I think it's really important because people always ask, why is support for Israel so overwhelming everywhere? Why is it so obvious that everybody supports Israel? Why is it still happening? And it has to do, I think, with these very, very minute details. And I'll say just one more thing, if I may. My sister is an educator, and she, about 10 years ago, she published a book called uh, Palestine and Israeli School Book. And one of the things she describes is how pictures are placed in, on the pages in the textbooks describing a massacre. 
what we would consider a massacre, or what we used to call as Israelis an operation, how Palestinians are portrayed, and again, where in the page is the picture? Where are the pictures of the commandos coming out of Gaza after a quote-unquote operation? Where are the pictures of the Palestinians who always look backwards or naked or ugly or... There's never a picture of a beautiful Palestinian or a Palestinian writer or poet. And I have a good friend in Gaza. She's a young, uh, young mother and she's got a beautiful young daughter. And she sends me pictures, even now. And I kind of, and it's, it's a little shocking because her daughter is so sweet and she, you know, they're like, there's this bright, beautiful face. And you wish that people would see that part of Palestine, bright, beautiful faces of people who are just lovely and engaging and want to live. And that's never, never part of a frame anywhere. So anyway, I just wanted to put that in context and to bring it back to part of the reason why there's such widespread support for Israel and why it's such a tough battle, uphill battle, to talk about Palestine in a positive way at all, never mind Palestinian rights, never mind a free Palestine from the river to the sea. I wanted to ask you, Gina, how do you think this, this this narrative can change and what do you see as the opportunity in this very very difficult moment for the people of Gaza uh, to be able to use this moment and not let it go by because you know these moments come in and so many people have given up their lives have, have died have been killed and I want to make sure that we don't let this slide by and then we're back to square one how do we keep it how do we keep the momentum moving because there is a shift you feel it Right? I think everyone feels that there's something happening out there that's different. Can you talk a little bit about what is happening that's different and where is the opportunity that we can actually shift this narrative? Sure. Um, maybe I'll segue from that image in the New York Times. When I asked if people read the New York Times in here, almost no one said yes, <laughs> which means you're getting news somewhere else. You're getting your information somewhere else. I am not. Uh, on social media. I'm not that kind of person. But I know almost everyone else that I know is, and that's where they, they get news. Um, and so does it matter to talk about the placement of where things are in the New York Times if it's not affecting so many people that I know? I think it still does matter. And I think also, even when we believe we're on the other side and we're getting different news, we're sometimes affected by the same larger framing. In other words, we share the same hegemonic context, the same ideological context, even when we believe we're actually fighting um, the power in that way. So it's not uh, incidental that, you know, yes, there's that image in the Times, but there's the story. I asked Andy, I said, Andy was showing us the story and uh, the image. I said, well, what's, what's on the headline? That's when we saw the headline about the soldiers getting killed. That's when we started to look elsewhere on the page. I said, that part matters quite a lot. But also what matters is that just as in 2000, we were ready for what happened after George Floyd was killed because of all the years of preparation and discussion. People are here now. People are here for Palestine Week, not because of what happened on October 7th or what's happened in the violence that ensued after. We're here because people have been learning about the Palestinian struggle over the past decades, and it is the reason why it's so threatening in the university where I work, not so much my campus, but in the university system where people work, in the newsrooms where people are working, in other organizations where people are losing their jobs. They're losing their jobs because power has shifted. So I don't worry that we're not taking advantage of this moment. The horror of what's been happening in Gaza since October 7th and frankly before is not, is not the thing that has us all here. What has us here is that enough people know, especially younger people, enough people know now about the ongoing genocidal violence to be ready to speak out and not to be intimidated anymore about uh, being threatened with being called an anti-Semite. As a university instructor, I'm told all the time that I have to create a classroom that is inclusive, and I actually do want to do that. But that does not mean that the research doesn't give me a point of view. I don't have a random point of view. 
I have a point of view because I've been, in, I've been reading and researching issues for a very long time. And that's one of the reasons why um, where I work, we chose to work with the organization al Haq. al Haq, I want to explain to everyone, has been working in Ramallah since 1979 as a human rights organization. And they were founded as an apolitical organization, which doesn't exactly mean what you think, but I think it's worth talking about. In other words, not, by not accepting the frameworks of politics as in which party are you involved in, who are you endorsing, what are you voting for, et cetera, et cetera, but rather to do investigations that are rooted in seeking out knowledge, exposing violations, and filling in for what the state was actually systematically erasing. And why now they're shifting toward the aesthetic sphere, toward a museum space, toward a gallery space, is because we're all recognizing that more and more information is not changing what is happening. We don't, we, I mean, you can tell me every day I read the stats on how many people have been killed. It's horrible, but it's not changing my relationship to the issues. So what will change our relationship to those issues? So when you say, am I hopeful that we'll be able to use this moment? I'm hopeful that all of the work that's been going on for so long is going to make for the impossibility of continuing this violation. I hold out the tiniest little bit of hope about what's going on in the ICJ. I hold out the tiniest little bit of hope about what's going on in the international community in general. Anytime I leave the United States, I realize how alone we are in our position now, and that's something new. So these are all things that have been emerging over the last 50, 60 years, and I think that is what we have to rely on, and so we don't stop. We keep going, we keep moving, and we don't allow people to characterize us as being anti-Semitic, as being um, even in some kind of facile way anti-Israel. But really, just as I speak as a US citizen, as a responsible person, witnessing the violence of carcerality, witnessing the violence of the border, I will speak about other violations I see around the world, especially the ones that I'm responsible for as a US citizen because of my tax dollars also going to pay for that violence. I want to turn to you, Miko, for a little bit. I know you are, um, you've been speaking out very forcefully about this issue for many years. You've written books about it. Um, as a self-loving Jew, as a self-loving Israeli, because I don't want to call you self-hating, because that's oftentimes what they refer to people who speak out for the injustices that are happening to Palestinians. Can you speak a little bit more about how you how how you've seen is there do you, do you see a shift do you see this shift that I think many of us are feeling in this room but you're on the front line so maybe you see something else can you share with us well I, I think what Gina just said is really really interesting and important and you said it this morning too that just because we see the images and we have the information that does not change things even though the information is available, even though the images are out there, the numbers of innocent people massacred, and it's not changing things. I think this is really important for us to kind of let it sink in and take it in and think about that. And whether I, it's here in the United States or in Europe or other countries, when I speak, you know, cr places are full. A lot of people come out. You know, since October 7th, we've seen hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people protesting because they see the images. And, uh, and, and certainly this is something that's been building up over the years, but we're still not seeing change. You know, in the UK, for decades, there have been pro-Palestinian protests and pro-Palestinian activism much longer than it has been here and in Europe as well. And it's not reaching, it's not breaking through this, whatever it is, gap or, or, or a glass ceiling into the halls of power, into the places where decisions are made. And that, I think, is our toughest challenge. Now, say what we will about the democracies in which we live in the West, 
we do vote for our representatives. We do pay their salaries. Why aren't they getting the message? Why don't they understand that we demand when they say zero tolerance to racism, they cannot possibly associate themselves with Zionism. They can't possibly say no tolerance for racism and then support Israel. That doesn't work. But, and again, that message for some reason is not reaching them. So are we missing something here? Do we, are we doing something wrong? Is there something we need to be different? I think so. Um, you know, the 25, 30,000 Palestinians who have been killed and the tens of thousands gendered over the last three months, that could have been prevented. It was predictable. I don't think anybody who has, was involved in Palestine did not know that the worst is still ahead of us. And I think even worse is about to come. So what are we missing? What is it that we're not doing? Because we have the information and we have the caring and we know what, what we want justice to look like, but our, the people who are making the decisions don't get it. They're not getting the message. I'll take it one step further. And when I say this, people think I've really lost my mind. The US Naval Sixth Fleet is in the Mediterranean. Those aircraft carriers, that naval force, can come in, provide humanitarian aid to the people in Gaza, which is, you know, to say that it's necessary or needed, you know, it goes without saying. They can provide this immediate care right now and enforce a no-fly zone over Gaza. I think everybody in this room, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, would agree with this. It's our Navy, we're paying for it. Why in the world are we, is it not happening? Why are we not demanding it? Are we not demanding it enough? Are we not demanding it in the right forums? You know, we want a ceasefire, we want an end to the genocide, but maybe if we were a little more specific in what we're demanding, maybe we need to just figure out a better way to make sure that we hold our elected officials and the media, and I don't read the New York Times normally either, but because of that, they've lo they're not relevant anymore. But we need perhaps to be more demanding of the media and our elected officials so that they understand that we demand that if there's a naval fleet, a US naval fleet in the Mediterranean, they need to protect Palestinians. Because nobody's protecting Palestinians now. If we have an elected official, again, it doesn't matter if they're school board members, city council members, mayors, police chiefs, whatever they, you know, it doesn't matter what they are. They cannot, they cannot have our voice if they associate themselves with any forms of racism and, and, and genocide, but particularly, in this case, Israel. That is acceptable, we will not allow that. So that, to me, is a problem that we are yet to solve. And until we solve that problem, and bring change about, and particularly here in Washington, D.C., I don't think we're gonna see anything different in Palestine. We're not gonna see an end to this, to this horror unless we're able to close that gap or smash the glass ceiling, like I said, whatever it may be, and reach the halls of power, which are geographically very close. So I think that's a challenge that we all, you know, I want to invite everybody to, to you know, think about and, and take on. And as groups, as individuals, as networks, this is, this is the challenge. If we can end this, like I said, this horror could have been prevented. The previous one could have been prevented. The one before that, I mean, they can all be prevented. And the next one is coming up in the next day, in the next week, in the next month, more is coming, more Palestinians are being killed, not, and again, not only in Gaza. Nadim Nashif was here, he did give a presentation earlier, he's from Haifa, he's a, city, he's a Palestinian citizen of Israel. Palestinian citizens of Israel living in, in terror. They have been for 75 years. Palestinians in the West Bank and Jerusalem are living a life of terror. Arrests, beatings, tortures, but nobody talks about that because it doesn't compare with what's happening in Gaza. So, you know, we have a lot of work to still do. I think the enthusiasm is good. I, I think it should continue regardless of what, you know, a particular attack because the terror under which Palestinians live is an ongoing thing. And I really hope that this will drive us to a point where we figure this out. Um, thank you. I want to turn to you as we wind down this conversation, Gina. Um, Dr. Dent, you are a professor. 
Uh, you, uh, yes, exactly. I have to call you Dr. Dent because you're a professor. And um, as a professor, we've seen how academic freedom has been challenged uh, during this uh, past few weeks, months, uh, in a very serious way. And we've seen the repercussions that anyone speaking up in pro-Palestine is uh, seen as supporting terrorism or worse, they get fired. Uh, and they get their jobs, you know, uh, um, threatened even. So can you speak a little bit about, you, you teach at one of the largest school systems in the country, UC, and uh, can you speak a, a little bit about what's happening at UC in particular, and overall give us a, a little bit of an understanding of where this is going? Well, it's a, it's a very complicated story, but let me just say, the concept of academic freedom is like the concept of human rights. These are Western uh, discourses framed in, under racial capitalism that uh, really are designed to preserve the status quo. Um, there are, there's an international law movement called TWIRL, which is like third world international law approaches, right? So TWIRL, sorry, TWIRL, not TWIRL, TWIRL something else, <laughs> TWIRL. Um, but you know, so there are ways of using those, um, those structures to do something different. And the same is to be said about academic freedom. So I use the concept, even though I know that I'm the one who's probably going to be least protected by the concept. Because the concept of academic freedom is generally used to protect those who are dominating. And so um, I both have to, uh, hold on to academic freedom, but I also have to say, we are not free to say anything as academics. We actually have a whole code of ethics around responsibility to knowledge and information. So what I have to respect are the researchers, the knowledge, and this is one of the reasons why the State of Israel is so invested in getting access to young people, college age people, getting access to think tanks, funding um, uh, alternative facts, <laughs> call them, uh, archeological um, knowledge, and dismantling the long histories that are in archives, including the ones that have been bombed recently in Gaza. So the, the disappearance of that knowledge and the discrediting of that knowledge as knowledge the epistemological war, for those of you who are academics, you know basically the way in which knowledge is framed, that is the war that's going on. And so it is really important for us to understand that we need to invoke academic freedom, but not to have that mean that it's like when the media says you need both sides. Academic freedom doesn't mean two sides. Academic freedom means I have to respect the evidence and I have to understand how that evidence has been framed, how it's come to me, where, where the roots of that knowledge are, what the primary sources are, what's been disappeared. That's my responsibility. It takes a long time to learn to do that. And so I don't just speak off the top of my head because I have an opinion because of who I am, because of my identity or who I know or where I've been. If that is what has been being protected by the university, then we will be protecting truth, then we'll be protecting more than facts. Facts are, you know, we all throw facts around. But it's the way in which those facts are arranged, it's the way in which we come to understand those things next to other things, the way in which we weigh and balance issues that are what we do as academics. Unfortunately, in the United States, we have made academia is so unpopular, right? We're always like against specialized knowledge. I go around the world and people are asking me to speak about the things that I study. When I am in the US, people are like, can you just talk about the stuff that like we can understand? I'm like, if I talk about what you already know, aren't you gonna be bored? <laughs> like, what is the point of that? Why would I study for all these years to tell you what you already know? But people are often asking for that in the United States. But that anti-intellectualism is tied to the racial capitalist forces that don't want us to know anything else. So yes, I will defend academic freedom, but what I'm really trying to say is that the researchers who know this information are the ones we should be listening to, and that 
I will affiliate myself with the people who have that knowledge, and I'm not going to feel responsible to bring someone in with an alternate opinion who happened to just decide that because of their identity or citizenship or you know, what their parents do for a living, they're going to say that they have another point of view or that I'm violating their rights. Yeah. I'm also reminded of the late, great Howard Zinn, who always said, you can't be neutral on a moving train. He actually stood right there where you are and said that. Uh, he said it in every class uh, that he had, and very, very special uh, he, human. Um, I want to turn to you for some final words, um, Miko. Uh, you were involved in the Israeli offense forces, and can you speak a little bit about what do you think is the end game here that Israel's trying to achieve? I mean, it looks obvious, I think, to many people, but can you speak a little bit more uh, in a nuanced way? What do you think that end game might be? I don't think the end game is clear to anyone, least of which, least of all the Israelis themselves. There is no end game. So if we look historically at what Israelis have been saying, what Israeli, you know, people who, who created Israel, people who established it, people who established um, kind of the Zionist thinking about the existence of Israel. Maintaining a, uh, an ongoing conflict for as long as it need, it's needed, as long as we're winning and we're killing more of them, that's, the, that's it, this is the end game. So Israel just managed to murder tens of thousands of Palestinians with no consequences. So that's, you know, that's, that's a step forward for them. And, uh, and it's just going to continue like that. There's no end game. This is it. In terms of Zionist thinking, this is it. We are always going to have to live like this as Israelis. That's why we have to have the best army. That that's why we always have to be the craziest, meanest bullies in the neighborhood, meaning the neighborhood where the state of Israel establish itself, and that's it. I, I do want to say in this context that you know, a, a relatively small group of Palestinian fighters who came out of one of the poorest and most oppressed areas on earth, a place where people are, are lucky if they have one meal a day and if they can find clear, clean water. These fighters that came out on October the 7th and did this managed to completely paralyze the state of Israel and put it in a state of chaos. Israel has been in a state of chaos since that day, and that, sorry, since that day, and that has not changed. It's only getting worse. Politically chaos, militarily chaos. Obviously, the Israeli intelligence and military have been, have been clearly proven to be nothing more than a paper tiger, other than their ability to murder civilians. So the end game, this is it. As far as, as long as anybody supports an Israel, as long as this thing called Israel, which is really just a fancy name for an apartheid state, continues, then this is it. We're gonna see more of this. So there are basically two choices. We either allow this to continue or we struggle to end it and replace it with something better, which would be a democratic, free Palestine from the river to the sea. These are the two choices. But in terms of the Israeli thinking, the Israeli ideology, Zionist ideology, what the end game is, this is it. We're going to continue like this. It's going to continue like this forever. So it's, again, I'm, I'm bringing this back to us. It's up to us to say enough. That's it. The last Palestinian you killed was yesterday. And you're not going to be allowed to kill any more Palestinians ever again. Unless we put that stop there, Unless we demand that stop there, unless we demand that goddamn naval fleet in the Mediterranean go in to support Palestinians, give them humanitarian aid, and impose a no-fly zone on Gaza, unless we take that power that we have and use it, we're going to see more and more and more because this is it. This is Israel. There is no other option. So again, I want to invite everybody to take the reins and make these demands and, and, and do everything we can to make sure that no more Palestinians are killed forever, period, from this point on. Because Palestinians have shown us two things, and I'll end with that. Number one, incredible courage. And number two, 
an inhumane ability, an unbelievable ability to sacrifice. And they deserve the freedom, but they deserve that we do everything we can to guarantee their freedom and guarantee their safety. Thank you. Thank you all for, for your attention and, all, and for being here and just being a part of all of this. And I just want to, as a way to close, I just want to say, you know, I, I've learned so much that prepared me, I think, for this issue um, from the prison abolition movement. And I just want to say that, bottom line, rethinking security, especially from a feminist point of view, is really what I think you're describing. The idea that, you know, when I talk to colleagues, in Israel-Palestine about the uh, weapons on campus, for example, that people carry, or the ways that, you know, the, that October 7th was about, oh, we're not secure enough. Investing in an idea of security, which is about further weaponization, really, for those of you who are prison abolitionists, we should also be thinking about this. Those of us who, you know, are thinking about carceral systems need to understand when we're asked to invest in security, what we're being asked to invest in. And really rethink, what is it that we think will make us safe? And certainly, no wall, no division, no apartheid, no way of managing populations in terms of poverty and no access to healthcare, food, and everything else people need in life is going to create safety. So let us all think about what this community means in terms of modeling what safety is and promote that as our security in the world. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Miko Pallet, and thank you, Gina Dent. What a wonderful conversation. I think we learned something we didn't know. Thank you, we appreciate you sharing that with us. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, uh, and when we come back, we're going to have a conversation with Angela Davis. So please stick around, uh, have some conversation. If you're sitting next to somebody you didn't know, uh, please introduce yourself and say hello to them. Yes. So, so something special just happened. I'm informed by uh, the head of Code Pink, Medea Benjamin. Come on up, Medea, and tell people. So while we are here, uh, a group of us just got back from President Biden's rally in Manassas at the George Mason College. He was interrupted with chants of Genocide Joe 14 times. P Politico just reported he tried to muddle through his prepared remarks but he couldn't get a sentence out without somebody jumping up and accusing him of genocide. So let's keep it up. As we continue to improve our democracy here, uh, I have with me here Kimon Freeman, who's running for, uh, uh, for a delegate for DC and in Congress. And he needs your signatures. If you're a DC resident, please sign his petition. <laughs> 